Um, and then the last wave is the one that's taking place basically in the 20th, 21st century, I would say still taking place today. And this is among cultural pluralists who argue that because every culture is so incredibly unique and so diverse, we should let all these kind of indigenous churches return to the original meaning of the gospel, the original message of the gospel, and forget all of these kind of Greek thought, terminology, et cetera. And that's the one I, I would say, if you're reading Reagan's Break, you can tell Ratzinger has a pretty hard time, <laughs> hard time with. It, it seems to be the one he's, he, he has the least tolerance for. Um, and one of the reasons for that is it just seems like it just assumes so many errors with respect to culture, but also re with respect to faith. So for, he brings this up in Regensburg, right? This idea of returning to the pure gospel. It's like, what does that mean? Like the New Testament is written in sure. Greek. Right, yeah. Like, <laughs> like the, the New Testament is written in Greek. As far as we know, there's only one book that wasn't written in Greek. Like the fathers say, Matthew wrote his gospel in Aramaic. We just have the Greek copy. So the New Testament is written in Greek. So this idea of de-Hellenizing, getting rid of the Greek, how are you going to do that? Right? Who like, would decide? Like right. how much of this is actually Greek? Because as you mentioned before, uh, the faith of Israel, which became the faith of the church, was very much influenced by the culture surrounding them, including the Greek one. So where would you draw the line? I mean, if you have the Septuagint, are you, are you you're, you're abandoning that? You're going with the Hebrew scriptures? I mean, I guess tongue in cheek, because that is in fact exactly what Luther wanted to do. Right. Yeah. So no, ex exact. So the New Testament's written in Greek. So even th it's it's funny because we brought up the term hypostasis earlier, the, the Greek term we use for describing the persons of the Trinity. Hypostasis that's in the Epistle of Hebrews, right? Logos, Sophia. What are you going to do with all this? Like, let's get rid of like the the creedal language, the the early language of the council is like, okay, well now what do you do with the New Testament? Oh, well, we'll have these brilliant theologian wizards who can get beyond the Greek and will abstract the. It's, Okay, well, now you're turning into a kind of, I don't know, neo-Marcionism, where you understand the message better. You can mm -hmm. cut and carve the scriptures as you want to. So so that knocks down the objections stemming from the Reformation. And it seems to me, uh, the, the liberal theologians of right. the 19th and early 20th century, that leaves that third movement, like the, the, the move to strip Christianity of all prior cultural elements, so that it can encounter new cultures and not have been tainted. Mm -hmm. uh, Ratzinger has a problem with this. Can, can you explain why? Yeah, well, I think a big part of it is that it basically just, it leads to the Hinduization of faith. If you're gonna go back to just kind of, okay, let's try and get to this pure gospel, which by the way, pure is like an abstract concept that doesn't even really make sense here. Cause again, we said how the gospel proclamation was in Greek. Right, at least it's it's how it's written in in, in uh, the four gospels, Paul, etc. To try and go back and just get this core message and then appropriate it into all these kind of different cultural forms means that we can't have a theology of translation. That there is the word, right? And theology's job is to interpret the word. It's not there to lay hands on a text. That is to seize the text and do violence to the word. That's not the job of theology. And so if you, if you do that, you're basically undermining the whole relationship between revelation, theology, faith-seeking understanding, and it leads to a kind of pluralism in the church where you have these kind of discrete blocks all standing around, as opposed to where you have a Pentecost, which is this communia where everyone's understanding in their language, in their tongue, and they're all being brought together. And so I think he sees it as very corrosive to Catholic unity. And I think a lot of the theologians who articulate it when you actually push them on some of their visions of what exactly they're, they mean here. Like for, here's an example, they're, they talk about like polygamy in Africa. Well, polygamy, right? It's like, well, in the African cultural context, if you actually study polygamy, it actually is this, oh, really nuanced, interesting thing. And maybe we can enculturate the faith in such a way that allows polygamy. And this is where it's so important to make distinctions between, <laughs> right? Definitive doctrine, like the seven sacraments and marriage, right? and secondary issues, right? Like, and, and that kind of distinction is lacking among many contextualists where it's like, maybe this is up for grabs and it's really not up for grabs. So you, uh, thinking in those terms then, if we were to uh, strip Catholicism of all prior cultural elements and then try to plug it in 
to a fresh uh, missionary context, we wouldn't actually be properly preaching the gospel. And it would probably, uh, it, it seems like it would actually harm missionary efforts to do yeah. that rather than boost them. Uh, right. Because I, you know, I was sort of skimming uh, your article while you were speaking, and there, there's this interplay between love and truth. And, and so uh, bear with me while I try to think this out uh, on the spot. But if we're bringing the truth to another culture that hasn't yet heard right, the message of Christ, we're doing that in a, out of love. And so for then, for me, if I'm the one doing it, for me to hold back some of the uh, riches of the faith, which has been, you know, tirelessly fought and won over many centuries, for me to withhold that from the culture I'm trying to evangelize, it sort of seems like what you, you all can have what's second best. We've right. got this treasure trove of tradition. We've got the, the unpacking of the scriptures. We've got this development of theology. We're reaching into the history and we're reaching into philosophy and we're reaching into art and politics and everything that Catholicism has ever shaped. Right. If you don't need that, we just want to let you know that, hey, God loves you. Right. That's so lame and weak. <laughs> I, I can't even begin to. And so... Well, Jacob, we could even take a step further there. If you're, there's actually, in a lot of this way of thinking, it's there's a subtle paternalism, yes. right? Kind of colonial, imperialistic paternalism that all these theologians say they absolutely despise. The way they talk about, oh, Africans, they don't really like, like they don't like those Greek terms, those categories. It's so hard mm -hmm. to, for them to understand. It's like, do you know how insulting that is? Right. Right. Like they like they can't they struggle with that. Guess who else struggles with that? Last time I was at the dinner table with my kids and we talked about the Trinity, my daughter was really like upset. Like, wait, there's three persons. <laughs> right. Like it's it, You're like, I know, I know. Right. It's like, this is, this is something to struggle with. So I think it's actually kind of a uh, very offensive paternalism to and, Asian, and honestly, Asian Africans. They can't deal with Greek ontology. It's like, that's pretty right. insulting. Yes. Well, no, no, it's, it's, it's funny because, uh, in, in the context of like, you, you mentioned like polygamy and marriage and, and other, uh, of the church's sexual teachings, uh, regarding human sexuality and all that, um, you find that it's actually the people saying, oh, these indigenous cultures can't handle it is really just code for you. Northern Europeans don't like it. Hmm. Like the, the problem isn't the Africans embracing, um, monogamy or uh, the Amazonians embracing a celibate priesthood or something like that mm -hmm. from a few years ago. The problem is that if you live near the Rhine, apparently you have an issue with some of these things, hmm. right? Uh, we, we should we should probably wrap up soon. I, okay. I, again, I want to be respectful of your time. I could talk to you all day long, uh, <laughs> Dr. O'Donnell. But can you give us a maybe some of your own thoughts on how we take um, the Regensburg address, we take the understandings from your article and we use them to renew our missionary efforts, right? Whether it's at home trying to re-evangelize America uh, and the West at large, or into actually some true missionary territory. Where do we go from here? What lessons uh, have we learned and what, what are your recommendations if you have any? Sure, sure. Ladies and gents, the preview is over. To watch the full video, go to canon211.locals.com and become a member. Become a supporter. Get access to exclusive content. Stay in touch with the Canon211 community. Well, that's it for today. Never give up. Keep on smiling. And memento mori. Cheers. <laughs>